which is nice for some things, but not what you want to do with your seedlings. So you want it, you want that uh, soil to be in total contact all the way around with all the roots. You don't want it so firm that you, you know you don't want it packed so hard that when you squeeze it together, it stays together, because then it's going to be too hard and it'll compact that way, and then your roots are going to have to work too hard to grow. We want them to have what they need, and we want it to be easy for them. I'm kind of lazy. I kind of the plants have lazy roots too. They kind of you know, they don't want to have to work too hard for the same thing. They, they could get it easier. Um, so the, um, the temperature is achieved in a number of ways. Your refrigerator, you can put it on top of your refrigerator if you have small quantities. If you, have, um, you, if you can put it behind your wood stove. If you can put a little something over the top of it to kind of hold heat in. Propagation mats are wonderful. Does anybody actually have a propagation mat here? You do? No, okay. Propagation mat is, now this is a secret, so don't tell anybody. But in the, when I start my plants in this time of year, we're still in the house, we'll break into the greenhouse next week when there's too many plants for my light bank that's in my basement. And in the old days, and not all of you are old enough to remember this, there was this phenomenon called water beds. And everybody had water beds, and then everybody moved and couldn't move their water bed into the new house because the floor wasn't strong enough, whatever. Waterbed heaters make fabulous propagation mats. <laughs> but don't tell anybody because I want them and they're getting harder and harder to find. <laughs> so um, and you put those under your trays. We plant in a 1020, which is a lie. It's really an 11 by 22, but they call them 1020s. It's just like lumber. The tray that you see your plants, your pots in, when I take trays of pots to farmer's market, that's you know what we're carrying them in. Um, and you put your tray on top of your propagation mat, put your thermostatic wire underneath it to make sure you don't burn your house down, because that's kind of a nice thing too. And then, um, then you've got, you've got uh, you can adjust the temperature for whatever the ideal needs of these particular plants are. You're not trying to heat a whole room space to 85 just to get your eggplant to germinate, you know. So that way you have more concentrated. The other thing, um, that's heat. And then we have light. Who's got light systems that they grow any plants under? You do? OK. And what kind of lights do you use? Um, I have variety of summer TAs, some of the, the smaller intensity ones. Um, OK. Like six yeah. rings of OK. What should we be using? I use a fluorescent burning light. It's a fluorescent um, grow light to light yeah. thing. It works for mm -hmm. like a full spectrum light. Is that what I use a, uh, uh, what well, I got a bank of bulbs that screw in, and then I just use those uh, uh, fluorescent uh, curly cube light bulbs. Okay. Well, I did a lot of experimenting. Uh, regular, it uh, works. regular uh, four or five watt bulbs, too. Okay, just regular household. I bought the really expensive grow lights and the full spectrum lights and the bed and bathroom lights and the kitchen lights and the cool lights and the hot lights. I have bought every light there was out there. And my shop light fixtures with two bulbs in them, the 99 cent cheap fluorescent cool white bulbs were where I got my best results. I mean, I had a fortune tied up in light bulbs. And well, I don't think they're 99 cents anymore, but probably the last time I bought them, they were. <laughs> Cool lights, fluorescent ones, the ones that you go and buy it for your shop. It's probably what's in these right now. The importance of light then is distance from your plants. You want it to be within four inches of the top of your plant if you can do that. We put our lights on chains so we can move them up if we need to. Um, but they do really, you really need 14 hours a day. And you want it to coincide with the light that we have, our natural light. You can extend it at both ends, but you don't want to have it be all night if it's going to be light out all day and there's going to be light seeping in the windows. You want them to have their natural day-night, day-night cycle. You just want them to have a little more day than Montana offers this time of year. Um, so we set them on a timer with 14 hours. And, um, and I have to say, we're not under lights a super long time because I do have a drop-dead gorgeous greenhouse. And uh, I use it. But this today, I don't want to be heating that greenhouse until I absolutely have to. So as long as I still have plants under my light bank, that's where they are, is on that rack of lights. And, um, and then when we do move into our greenhouse, we shut half of it off and just heat a portion of it until we need the whole thing. 
Um, our greenhouse happens to be a Northside Earth Firm greenhouse, so it's super moderated. It doesn't really freeze out. It doesn't really get too hot in the summer. The, f the soil makes a great berm. Um, if you don't have a greenhouse, stack, stack straw bales. You can just do you know, a U-shape, build your straw bales up, put a window over the top, and those straw bales, particularly if you have them dark, like something over them to keep them dark, they'll absorb that heat all day and put it out all night. And that's a nice, simple, easy way to go, just to put a few trays out. Um, the other thing we talked about this morning, which I'm going to talk about now, is air. Air circulation is so important to good plant health. Storage health on your plants, storage health on your food, storage health on your seeds, and your plants while they're growing. Um, we achieved that through fans. Um, and it makes a wondrous difference in how your plants can grow. There's a, I'm going to grab a pot while I'm talking, but there's a, a problem called damping off fungus. Has anybody ever uh, encountered that? Damping off is it's a fungal growth, and it happens if right at your soil level. So when you fill a pot with soil, you don't want to fill it an inch down because you've got this whole wall of plastic blocking good air circulation. So if you can keep your soil level almost to the top, not quite, and when you fill your pots, you want to fill them to the top because they will condense a little bit. But if you can keep them almost to the top, you're going to get more air circulation. And damping off is when your stem rots right at soil level. And there's two, three, maybe, I don't know, quite a few things you can do about damping off. But the primary one is keeping good air moving around the plant so that fungus doesn't settle on top of your soil and at the base of your plant you get good airflow. We need fresh air so the plants. They're not naturally growing inside a greenhouse with no air movement. They're naturally growing outside when the time is right. We're asking them to perform at a different time and in a different situation. So we have to provide what they want. Um, the other thing you can do about damping off, if you should see it start to develop, is you can feed it antifungals. And you're like, ooh, well, the best antifungal is chamomile tea. We water our plants with chamomile tea. And it does an amazing job. You want your soil level to your soil surface to dry out occasionally, but that's a, that's a tough one because you want your, the moisture down below, but you want the surface to dry out. If you're working on a heat mat, you're going to be drying from the bottom up, not from the top down. So you got to watch that because you have to water pretty often to keep those roots damp at the bo bottom of your pot or your tray. And um, yes. Nope, only if I have a problem. Okay. Yeah, if I... Or cold. Or, or cold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, it's like if I, I sometimes drink it with the plants and then you know, I take a nap with the plants too and it's all good, yeah. Did you have a question? Oh, there's actually same question. Okay. So we look at air, we look at soil level, we look at chamomile tea. Fennel is also a good antifungal, but chamomile is usually a little cheaper and easier to get than fennel year-round. Um, we move things around so that they're near or closer to a fan as it needs. Certain plants have more of a propensity to damping off than others. Um, using clean equipment so you're not carrying over fungus from previous years. If, you're, if you feel like you have a lot of it, you can always, you know, if you're going to reuse your pots, wash them, and I hate to say this, maybe use a little um, uh, oxygen-based uh, bleach. Not a, I wouldn't use a... Well, you could use a, a regular cord bleach, but you can also use an oxygen-based bleach to clean your pots and things like that. Um, the other thing that uh, controls fungus is fungus gnats, which um, are kind of like fruit flies. This is what they look like to you, but they're, they're similar but different. And, fun and if you get fungus, you're probably going to have fungus gnats. Now, you don't really want a lot of fungus gnats because if there's no fungus to eat, they'll eat something else. So it's all about balance. But a little bit of fungus gnats isn't a bad thing because they'll keep your growing area clean, having a little bit in there because that's, that's their dining, that's their dinner is fungus gnats. Yeah, that's what starts them. If you see a, a ton of them, then you know you've probably got a ton of fungus that you need to deal with too. But um, anyways, um, you don't want to start your plants too early. We're going to start some today that, that can get, you know, started soon. Because if you start them too early, no matter how good your light system is, if you're under lights, you're going to get leggy. 
If you put them in a window, even if it's a south window, it's not enough light. The glass blocks a little bit, but you're just not getting direct. It's just angled light. You need top light down on them too, not just angled light coming in. So you're going to find you have leggy plants. If your plants start getting leggy and you don't want to lose your plants, you can always bump them up into a bigger pot, but most of them you should be able to bury a little bit deeper to strengthen them too. Um, and, and just, you know, if, if you've got your tomatoes ready and there's still three feet of snow on the ground and you're going to be putting them outside, you don't want to save them. Well, you never know. We do have a fair bit this year. So those, those things are all um, uh, adaptable a little bit, but if you can time your planting um, to match what you th expect, you know, tomatoes can grow out at six weeks old. They don't have to be in the ground for 12 weeks. Um, if you're going to have them in the ground for 12 weeks, you might want to put them in big pots or hanging pots or things like that. But, um, uh, but you could also just do them later. We stagger our tomato planting for the greenhouse. We have people who like to start early in their greenhouses. We have customers who want to direct, direct um, transplant right into the soil later. So we usually do three to four plantings a year of tomatoes, just smaller plantings to accommodate all of that because we don't like our plants to get too big. Another plant you don't want to get too big is your brassicas, um, cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli. They do not like to be transplanted, particularly cauliflower, when they're very old. They want to be transplanted when they're young. You could transplant them out at three weeks. You can transplant them out up to six weeks. You could take some of them up to eight weeks. Cauliflower, no. Max is out at six weeks as to how old you want it to be when you put it out there. It just resents the transplanting by then. It wants its space. Um, again, if you have a pot like this that's got a six pack in it of broccoli and you can't get out to put it in, you can always take each one and put it into its own pot to kind of hold over until it's ready to go out into the field. So um, let's see. Some, sometimes, um, particularly, is there anybody here that starts or wants to start onions, those kind of things, alliums? OK. They get sturdier if you actually give them a haircut which is really fun to do because they look really good when they're all like at the same level and you, you're giving them a little clip. And then when you do it, you grab those tops. Yes, and they're delicious on your baked potatoes that you still have in the root cellar from last year with the butter you churn from your cow. Anyways, <laughs> we don't have to go there. But, um, <laughs> OK, <laughs> from your neighbor's cow. <laughs> So that helps make them sturdy. They will be a much stronger, more upright, easier plant to transplant, and they will, and they will really react better to your field growing if you keep them trimmed. We trimmed about three inches, and usually they get trimmed two at the absolute most three times before they go out in the field. Um, Does that include garlic, too? No. Just <laughs> onions? Onions, leeks, shell, uh, seed shallots. Not bulb shallots, but seed shallots. Um, yeah. Um, if they get too tall, they're putting all this energy into this top growth that's actually dying. You know, you'll notice you get the shrivelies on the end there. Um, so, and, uh, and we, <laughs> the, um, we do our onions from seed for a number of reasons. A lot of people buy onion sets, but onion sets are going to, again, they're a second year plant, so they're going to have more of a propensity to want to go to seed and not make a nice onion. Uh, also, you're very limited on what varieties are available of onion sets, and they're expensive. So we do our, um, all of our alliums from seed, both in the field and what we sell through the greenhouse. Um, I just find that it's a, it's a better system. Um, seeds, seed depth. OK, we plant seeds twice as deep as the size of the seed. Now, that works great when you're talking about for instance, an onion seed, or even a kale or broccoli seed that's totally round and every dimension is the same. But when you get to um, a squash seed, you've got your long dimension, you're really skinny, and then your width. So we use the longest for the most part. Um, the bigger the seed, obviously, then the deeper it's going to go. I take a little exception with peas, although we don't start them inside. I go really deep with peas. I go two inches deep with peas. They don't like to dry out along the way, and they like it cool, so that way they have cool feet because it's the top inch or so of soil that's going to get really hot. But that's not really part of today. That's just an aside. Um, record keeping is really important. If you're going to be doing this year after year, I have a woman that comes to the greenhouse every year, and she's got her notebook, and she's like, I want this tomato plant because this is what she's got notes for every variety she grew and everything she's done. 
thank you very much. Your maps are very important. They give you your records. We have, this is called the seed notebook. I have one notebook just for seed. And the, this is an old one. I didn't bring the new one. But it's got about 10 years of seed growing in it. And it's got um, my inventories from every year. And those inventories are very helpful. It tells, when I do my inventory, it tells me what I've got in-house. I can look at how much I had last year. And then I know how much I use, so I know how much I want to get for this year if I need to buy it or grow it or keep it or whatever. And then it also has a planting chart. And this keeps me on time. 2013, this would be. It tells me um, mint. I planted six rows in a mama tray on April the on uh, January the 29th. And then on April the 29th, I planted out into individual pots 112 of them. So what that means, and I know that might be gobbledygook, what's a mama tray? Mama trays are a 1020 that's solid. It doesn't have that mesh bottom on it. And we double them up and we fill them with soil to the top. And then we cut rows in them anywhere from 10 to 15 rows, depending on what it is. And we sprinkle seeds in the rows. And then, so one row in a mama tray, if there's six rows of mint, mint seed is minuscule. Like, take a poppy seed, I mean, it would just womp out your mint seed. It's mint seed's so tiny. So um, you just sprinkle along in a row. And from those six rows, I got 112 that I transplanted, each into their own pot, a couple months later. It's a slow-growing plant. We do it on January 29th because the small seeds grow slow. Oh, wait a minute, we already talked about that, so you guys knew that. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. I would say, you know, we transplant, like, herbs into what we call an herb pot. This is an 1801, an herb pot, which would be considered a 2801. Um, and that tells you how many pots fit in a tray. But we, so it's a smaller round pot, and, we do, and um, of those 28 in a tray, I'd say two of them might not make it in each tray because they got overwatered when they got transplanted or whatever. Um, so the pots, this is an 1801, 18 of them fitting your tray. It's an 01 because it's all one compartment. If it's got the lines in the middle, that would be an 1804 if it was split up into four parts, or an 1802 if it's cut in half. That's what those numbers mean. It's this secret language thing. You have to do a handshake and kick somebody or something. I don't know. But, um, so the, uh, the mama tray then only holds for so long. Different plants stay in it. You know, like tomatoes, we start in a mama tray. We don't start in each pot. Way too much space. Way too many seed wasted. If you want to make sure you have a plant and you know you've got a 70% percentage on the um, germination rate, then you're going to wind up putting two in, and then you're going to have two in here, and one's going to have to go. So we go for a mama tray, and then put each plant in its own pot. So that brings me, I'm talking really fast. Am I doing OK? Can you guys hear? Yeah. OK. Um, and please do ask questions if you have them. Don't wait for me. Are, OK. There's some seeds that are light sensitive, and you don't want to put dirt on Yes. Them. Are those, I know flowers. I can't think of any vegetables. There are very few vegetables that I can think of that would be like that, actually trying to think what the I herbs, did. The herbs, yes. The super small seeded things tend to get lost in the soil. Um, s different seeds have different needs as far as light goes. And again, the good catalogs will tell you. Um, the, uh, I mean, like celosia and some of those like light. Um, but for the most part, um, some seeds like to get beat up. They like to get vernalized which means lavender, rosemary, parsley. We put those in the freezer for a few weeks. Fertilization, it's mimicking what would happen if they were out in nature. Um, it's going to be really cold, and then it's going to get warm again. And the seed, that takes the seed out of dormancy, and it increases your germination rate and your vigor. Some seeds like to get scarified. Um, we scarify borage. We scarify morning glories. Um, we scarify things that are super hard and thick coated. Scarification, there's a couple ways to accomplish it. You can take two pieces of um, sandpaper and do it this way. It's thinning or cracking the coat so moisture can get into it. Because they have a very thick coat, like a bitterroot, I think takes five years in soil to germinate or something like that. And this is why we never see bitterroots at the market, right? Because <laughs> we'd have to store them all winter long. But it, it kind of, it, think of, Animal hooves stepping on that seed, cracking it open a little bit, making it so the moisture can get into them. And so we can scarify with sandpaper. We can scarify with 
Um, I, I, my morning glory is I take a serrated knife and I take each seed and I run it over twice with the serrated knife. And I get 100% germination from a morning glory that might be marked at 60% on the package. Look at your seed packs when you buy seeds. Good seed packs will have germination rates on them, not all do. Um, but seed, so seed is the most important, that's why we're all here today because we're freeing seeds. And seed is the most important thing you have to look at. If you don't have good seed, you can do all the best practices in the world, and it's not going to work. You've got to have good seed. Um, a good seed packet will, like I started to say, tell you the germination rate. It'll say 70%. It'll tell you when that was tested. Uh, most of them will say a year. For instance, um, Johnny's seed pa or, uh, Fedco seed packages will give you a date. And it may say, like, 10 17. That's October of, of 2017. Well, that tells you they tested it then so they could get it out into distribution for 2018. So a 17 seed doesn't necessarily mean it's tested for the year 17. That is when the testing actually happened. Regulation says that seed testing for, you know, there's minimal germination rates for every seed set down by the federal government. You don't have to put the germination rate on a packet, but you do have to test to make sure you meet those minimum government germination rates. And they, they vary tremendously upon what the seed is. So I'm not going to go into what they are, also because they don't know. But um, um, the, the, if it doesn't say a germination rate, you know it has to at least meet that minimum on it. And the regulation also says they need to be tested every 13 months. It's not every year. So some seed houses will test. Um, like, in, uh, for one, one, do one test, it'll work for two growing seasons. A good seed house will do it every year. Um, so what I was going to show you in here, one thing I really like about this catalog, you can open to any page, and it'll show you, a, there'll be a lengthy description. It'll take you how many days. It's a very humorous description, if you've never looked at a Fed code catalog. What's that? Oh, yeah, it's a treat to read this catalog. It totally is. But at the very end of the description, there's a number in a circle. It'll say anywhere with numbers 1 through 6. You know what that is? OK. That number tells you who produced the seed. Not who specifically, but what type of farm it was, whether it's a small local farm, certified organic farm, um, multinational corporation, or number six is a multinational corporation that also sells GMO products. Not that it would be GMO seed, but there's information. You can never have too much of it, and it's good. Um, triple divide seeds, which is my seed cooperative. Um, there's a table downstairs, and there's a lot of seed being given away there. It's all 100% Montana, 100% organic grown um, seed, and it's a cooperative, and it's I, we pride ourselves on having the best seeds for our region, all open pollinated. Um, that's just a little plug there. I haven't been paid in five years, so it doesn't really matter if you buy or not. But <laughs> no, that's not really true. <laughs> but, um, but your seed is very important. You want to make sure your seed is quality. Uh, you want to make sure that your seed uh, fits your bioregion, that your seed is going to grow. I'm going to give you an example of onions. Everybody knows what a Walla Walla is? Yeah. And Walla Walla, Washington is about on the same level that we're on. Uh, is that latitude or longitude? Whichever, whatever that is. The same north-south. Um, and then there's Vidalia onions. People are here, anybody heard of Vidalia onions? OK, they're also a sweet onion. Not, un, not dissimilar to a Walla Walla, but they're from Georgia. So a Vidalia onion will not grow here. The onions are what's known as a day length sensitive plant. So they tell you what it's latitude. You know, latitude, the, an onion range would be from latitude 42 to latitude 52 would grow where we are because we're 48. And um, a Vidalia, I think, is 38. And it just wouldn't work here because we just, we don't have the same length of, of hours. So that's one place that day length sensitive has meaning. Another place, um, spinach is a day length sensitive plant. Um, but in a little different way, spinach um, goes to seed when the days get long. You all think, oh, it's July and it's too hot, the spinach is going to bolt. Well, it's not because it's too hot. It's because the days are too long. There's too much sunshine. So spinach bolts because of the sunshine. That's the kind of plant it is. We do a spinach called everlasting spinach that is um, not day lane sensitive because it's biennial technically. So it's technically more a cross between chard and spinach. 
But um, so the first year, it's never going to go to seed because it's biennial. So you're going to get spinach year round. Yes. One of the tricks that I do is spinach to get it to go in June, which it didn't work long in daylight hours. Well, put it up, plant it in the shade of another plant. Mm -hmm. And that really reduces my whole thing. It does. It really likes that. That's a good idea. Yeah. Um, so the other thing you can do with things that want, you wind up starting early is trim them. Uh, but some things you want to get bushy anyways. Basil, uh, marigolds, chickabitties. There's certain plants that you'd rather they bush out instead of just getting taller and taller. So if you keep them pinched back in your greenhouse, you always want to, you know, if this is your plant, right, and you've got your two little side leaves and your main stem, you want to pinch this off and then these can grow and make it get bushier. And that's another way to, you know, if you get things going early and you can't quite get in the field, a lot of things can be trimmed. I wouldn't trim corn. I think you'll lose it. But we do transplant corn. Again, corn is a, needs a very specific heat to germinate. Our soil is cold in the fall, so we don't, or in the spring, so we don't put our corn out directly. We can only grow corn from transplant. We used to do it directly, but it was such a gamble. So we do it... Um, we transplant our corn, but we want to set it out at two and a half, three and a half weeks, somewhere in that time frame before its roots get too big. So some things, and then we can, you know, provide the temperature it needs, which is what's corn's biggest thing is, is to get the right temperature. The other thing you can do with seeds to help them along, particularly your larger seeds, it's hard with small seeds, is you pre-soak. Um, we pre-soak the corn even when we're planting it inside, because it takes so long for corn to, it's so, it's so hard and dense, it's hard for it to absorb moisture. So if we just soak it in a bowl of water for 24 or 48 hours before we plant it, whether we're planting it in the greenhouse or outside, it just gives it a huge jump on things, you know, a lot less babysitting time in the greenhouse when you've got it in a bowl of water for a few, just for a couple of days. That makes a big difference there. Um, uh, we talked about this, and I'm going to repeat it, though. Um, you want your seeds to be bioregional because, like carrots, things like that, there's certain tomatoes that are grown in many places all over the world. A lot of, a lot of our seed actually comes from the other hemisphere, it comes from South America, because um, they can grow it there in the winter, which is their summer for us for the next year. So a lot of crops are grown down there. We get our stevia and lemongrass from there. Those are seeds we, we haven't been saving up here. Um, but just because, you know, they have the opposite season from us. But th those are super specialty crops. But if you're looking at your regular, let's put away the food crop, you want seeds that are adapted to here. You don't want a carrot seed, even if it's the same carrot variety, or a tomato seed, even if it's the same tomato variety that was grown in a Florida area for, you know, the last 10 years, and they've been selecting seed that works well for that area. You want seed that works well for our area. Our area is super specific on what it needs. Okay, any questions at this point? Do you inoculate? Some things. We inoculate, the question was, do we inoculate? Inoculation um, is a bacteria, a rhizobial bacteria, that um, we use on peas and beans. That's the only thing I inoculate. And um, we do it at planting. If you don't do it right at planting, you do it in the furrow after you've planted. But we use less inoculant if we, we soak our pea and bean seed before we plant it because, again, like I said, it helps it germinate faster, less time for the birds to pick it out of the ground or whatever. And um, so we soak our seed, we drain it, and then we sprinkle inoculant on, and then we plant our seed and cover it up. Um, one thing with inoculant, it's fabulous. It's a natural occurring soil bacteria. Um, and uh, your soil should already have it. If you've ever inoculated, they say you don't need it. It's cheap insurance if you're not sure if that spot had it or not. I just do it routinely. But beware that some bacteria are genetically modified. Yeah. Hmm? Well, it's yes. No, it's not required to say so. It's only required, there's no requiring on labeling on GMOs. We all know that. So you have to know your source. Look in the catalog you get it from. You know, read. See where you're ordering it from, and just they will tell you if it's not. If it is, it probably won't say. So what's it protecting them from? <coughs> bacteria aids in the set nodules on leguminous plants, so um, it helps them take up nitrogen to set nitrogen and to take nutrients up from the soil. You know, like when you pull up the pea plant and there's all those little nodules on the roots, it helps those form. Okay. 
is basically what its purpose is. Yeah, so um, um, let's see. All right, uh, timing. You talked about starting your early stuff. But there's some things that like it cold. So there's some things you want to get out when it's cold. Can anybody tell me? Spinach. 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 Yeah. Likes it because the short days, that's not the temperature so much. Peas like it cold. Kale. Kale will take it cold. It'll do, go either way. Yep. Um, peas and fava beans. Fava beans are different from your pole beans or your bush beans, your green beans, and your other drying beans. Fava beans, they want, the minute you can get in the soil, they want to be in the ground. Um, they, so they're great. They're a great bean for us to grow in this area. They do well in our region. They're great for the soil. And, um, and, they're, and they're very pretty. They're great at attracting beneficials. They, the flowers look like they're going to be a black-eyed pea, not a fava bean. They're white with black centers. But um, they're a totally underserved plant that we adore. We actually have five varieties of favas on the farm. But because they cross-pollinate, we don't plant them all the same year. But um, uh, you know, those are things that like to go out when it's cold. So as soon as you can, things that like to go out when it's cold that I would start early are your alliums. Everything else we pretty much direct plant that likes to be cold. The only thing we transplant is the onions. You will notice that onions in catalogs say anywhere between 95 and 130 days. And you've got to watch those numbers when you're buying seeds. Um, you want to, for us, early is good. You know, because even onions don't necessarily mature and dry their tops down in the field. If you have a 130-day onion and we have a 60-day frost-free where we are, most of you guys probably have more like an 80 or a 90, I would think. I don't know if you know. What are you? Well, you're close to me. <laughs> yeah, 60 days. But um, So you want to look at those numbers. They will take a light frost, but they won't necessarily take a hard frost. And you want them to, dry, to not only get edible, but get their tops and onions be able to dry down. You want to break their tops off so they dry and they store. If you're, growing, if you're growing your onions from seed, you're not playing around. You want to do it right. So, um, uh, <sighs> There's so much. <laughs> there is. So much. I love plants. So you want to provide light. We've got that one talked about. You want to provide good soil. You want to provide temperature. We've talked about that a little bit. What's the last thing we haven't talked about? Humidity. Water, Water. humidity, moisture. This is the hardest thing in the greenhouse. I have an internship program, and getting these kids to get it right on watering is super hard. You want it moist, but you don't want it soggy. You don't want it to dry out, but you don't want it too wet. It's super hard to do. We talked about if you have bottom heat, it's going to dry out from the bottom first. So you might not notice if the top still looks moist, that your bottoms are dry out. Pick it up. If it's light, water it. If it's heavy, don't water it. You know, that's one way to look at it. You know, we have rows of hanging baskets in the greenhouse, and I just tap them as I go down the row. And if they get a good swing going real easy, then I know I need to water them. And if they just go thunk and I hurt my knuckles, then I know that I <laughs> can wait to do that, you know. Um, so it's, you want certain things like basil, you want that top to dry out. Rosemary, lavender, we put sand in our soil when we pot the rosemary and lavender because sand has good drainage and they don't like wet feet. They don't like to be dried out totally. But think about where you'd be planting it out in the field and try and mimic it what you're doing inside. We put for a five gallon bucket of soil, I put in one shovel of sand. And I happen to live in a sand pit, basically. Our soil is all sand, so it's right there. For me, it's not a problem. Rosemary, rosemary. Yeah, which are both super small, super, sl super slow to germinate, and super slow to grow the first six months. They're just small. We, when we sell transplants of them, they're usually pretty small, unless they're two-year plants. But a one-year plant, they're, they're pretty small on those. So moisture is challenging. To, to get it right, to not get the damping off, and to still have it have it um, have enough moisture to grow. It's a challenge. You need, you need to keep your records. Remember, what, if you've got a great memory, it's fine. If you've got a youngster around, external hard drive, tell them and let them tell you next year. But otherwise, <laughs> write it down. You know. Um, How often are you adding fertilizer to your water? 
that's where I'm coming to next. <laughs> the one thing we're not haven't hit yet is nutrients. And I do not fertilize in the fields. Very, when we transplant, yes. But for the most part, unless there's a huge flood, we just like to have our soil provide our fertility. We do manure, we do a lot of cover cropping, we do things like that, but we don't do a lot of feeding. If I do any feeding in the field, it's a foliar because there's a storm coming or frost coming, and we want to give it some kelp, some vitamin B to keep it going. But in a pot is another story. In a pot, the roots can't just keep going to find what it needs if it's not right there in its small space. So we have to provide it. We have to address its nutrient needs. And we do that in a couple ways with fish emulsion and with kelp. Fish emulsion is basically nitrogen. That's its strongest. It's got a lot of trace minerals in it also. But kelp is vitamin B. When we're feeling sluggish and depressed or low energy, we take vitamin B. Vitamin B is really good for us. It's good for plants too. Just like nitrogen is their protein. There's so much work being done right now and on researching the similarities between human and animal needs and plant needs. And, and it's right there. It's just we haven't really grasped it yet, but it's in our face. So when we are feeding plants in the pots in the greenhouse, we are using um, a hose end uh, siphon, which um, goes into a bucket with the, manu the fish emulsion and kelp in it and then goes onto your spigot, and then you put your hose on that, and that hose then siphon, siphons up the, the water with the um, kelp and fish in it, and we're watering with it. It's hitting the leaves, it's hitting the soil, it's feeding it in every way you can. If you're just trying to do a foliar feed, you want to get the underside, because the skin is thinner on a leaf on the underside than on the top side. It needs to be protected more on the top side from sun than the elements, but then the, that's why I always find the insects on the underside of a leaf first because it's a thinner skin there and so it can absorb it faster. So um, you want to, um, so we do that once a week. We call it feeding day at the zoo and we try and do it um, a couple days before we go to a farmer's market so they're not too stanky. <laughs> Fish is what it is. It doesn't bother me after all these years but it is what it is. And um, there are other ways to do it if you don't want to do fish, but I find that the easiest. And we do it fairly mild, um, but uh, with the hose and siphon, you have to be sure. Proportions are different. To, I'm not going to even go there. You know, it's on the package. Um, but, uh, so can you buy fish and somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> no, there's all kinds of ways. We sell it. You sell it? Is it like a powder? I, I don't even know what yeah. it is, really. Fish poop? Well, I've always called it fish poop, <laughs> but technically, it's not. It's oh, okay. the it's discards like of fish. It's yeah, it's what it is. So you could buy a fish and take home and put it in your blender. Native Americans planted a fish in the hole and they put a corn or a squash seed in. That's why. That's why, because fish is super high nitrogen. Okay. Which, I mean, it's super high protein. People eat it because it's high protein food. It's also protein for the plants, which is nitrogen. So it's kelp seaweed. Kelp is seaweed. So how are we finding that around here? Uh, I sell it. Do <laughs> so you, you bring it in from like California? I bring it in in 44 pound boxes. Okay. And I put it in little baggies and I sell it in the greenhouse. But you could probably get it at any greenhouse supply store or order it in yeah. with any of these seeds. If you order, Triple Divide doesn't sell amend amendments, but Fredco does, Johnny's does, High Mowing does. They all sell amendments. And what places like a 10 10 10 fertilizer bag that you would buy from like Lowe's? I've never used a 10 10 10, so Something I don't know. Like that. This is a place <laughs> it's that. all we use when our plants are in their pots okay. is we use, we use the kelp and the fish emulsion. And the kelp is one of the brand names is Maxi Crop. And fish emulsion can be Mermaid, and there's a couple other brands. You want to check them because, again, they could have ingredients in them you don't want. You want to make sure they are OMRI approved. If anybody knows what OMRI is, it's Organic Materials Review Institute. They, they approve inputs for organic um, farming. Or it could be certified organic by CCOF or Oregon Tilt or Montana Department of Ag or Washington Department of Ag. Those are some of the four main ones for certifying products. But um, 
And we don't use it, like I say, once they get out of the pots, unless if we put out things, if we put our beans out too early and it's going to freeze, I might hit them with kelp to help ward our frost. It's for shock, is basically what it is. Transplant shock is one of the biggest issues. When you dig up a plant that's been all, oh, I'm so happy, they've given me this great soil, giving me food and all this good stuff, and I can keep growing my roots, and then you yank it out and put it in another pot. It's going to go, oh, so at that point, you want to get a kelp. We always kelp when we transplant. The other thing is when we transplant, we have a table that we transplant. Um, you know, we do our transplanting, and then we have a table that's got like a dip tray in it that's about this deep, and it holds um, three of those mama trays or 12 uh, 1020s. And rather than top water, we bottom water. There's two reasons for that. One is your plants will want to take it up from the bottom. And two is when you top water, it's really hard not to hit the leaves. You've got this plant that's going to be wimpy. You're taking it from a mama tray to a pot, and you're taking away a lot of its little roots that are going to break off. And it's going to be wimpy. So when it gets a few drops of water on a little tomato plant, it's going to touch the ground. And it's going to get weak where it bent, and it's going to rot where it touches the ground, where the moisture is. So. Um, we dip into kelp water. At that point, I'm not giving fish emulsion. Fish emulsion's a little bit strong for it at this point. We're just giving the kelp water, and we're put, dipping it into it so it absorbs it from the bottom. If I have to top water because I've got trays backed up, which happens a lot, I'll just, I just have a little household watering can with a super thin spout, thin spout, and I go up and down either side of the plant and then across between it and get my top water in there. I try and avoid getting water on my leaves when I'm doing that. So. Till they're very heavy, okay. and then um, our rack is set up so that we take out of the out of the dip tray and we put it up here on some uh, roofing and sort of slide angle so all the water goes back into the drip tray so I'm not just making a mess. And then the other thing is it's again it's wimpy. I'm going to put it on a shelf in the shade for a couple of days, or under my benches in the greenhouse. But we have under our rack we have a lot of shelves that we put them on that. Um, you know, gives, you don't want it too cold, you know, you have to kind of watch what's going on there. It's, it's you know, watch it, because if it's not drying out a little bit, it's staying too soggy and you're going to damp off. Oh yeah, damp off. And damp off doesn't need heat. Damp off works when it's cold too. So you want, but even if, if it's a cloudy day, you're fine. But if it's a super sunny day, it's going to ask for too much perspiration in those plants, and they're not going to be able to take up enough moisture because of their broken roots. You know, I, I could tell you they don't, but they have broken roots. It happens. We can't do it without breaking the roots. So be faster than they can take up moisture to replace it, so they're going to wilt and lose strength that way. So, yeah. Have you ever experimented with, uh, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the algae aquaculture mm -hmm. technologies, that they have the liquid and then they also have like a, it looks like a charcoal. Mm -hmm. Have you ever used any of that in any of your products? It's never been approved for organics until this year. Oh, okay. So no. And I think they are approved for it now. So what do you do for soil prep so that when you do put it in, and you, like you do that in the fall, you get your soil ready for Are you talking about the field uh -huh. or in the pots? In the field. In the field. Okay. Um, awesome. We cover crop. That's a whole other class, yeah. <laughs> but we do a lot of cover crop in the fall, and then we do our soil prep in the spring. I don't have any beds done up in the fall because I want it under cover as much as possible. What are you using for the cover crop? Do you use this Basilia? Um, I use, in the fall for cover crop, I use um, Austrian winter pea and annual ryegrass that comes up in the spring, and then we work it down. And then in the summer, we use Fasalia um, because it's a beautiful, beneficial attractant. It's gorgeous, and um, it produces a lot of organic matter, competes well with weeds, and buckwheat. Yeah. And I love buckwheat because... Buckwheat is a fast growing, I mean, it can be 30 days till it flowers. It, it is so fast, and it's this tall in 30 days. It takes a little bit of moisture. We, we plant our squashes pretty far apart between rows. We cultivate once between the rows, and then we put um, buckwheat in after we've done that. Um, so, so then the buckwheat grows so fast, weeds can't grow, and by then the squash are big and taking over the buckwheat, and all is good in Wonderland. And then what so. do you do in the spring? Cutting the buckwheat? That's in the summer. Um, sometimes I cut it, sometimes I let it go. It just depends. Sometimes we'll just cut the tops so it won't go to seed and we'll let it keep being bushy. Um, we'll just use a scythe or a weed eater or something on it to cut it. Um, it sometimes I time it so that it goes down with frost yeah. because it's very frost sensitive and then we just disc it in in the fall. But I love buckwheat. And when you walk out, anybody ever been in a field of buckwheat? 
it's got these beautiful flowers. They're really aromatic, and they're like the bees adore them, buckwheat honey. And you go out there, and the whole field is just vibrating. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah it's and pretty nice. What was your fall cover crop? Austrian winter pea and annual ryegrass. And we plant it late enough in the fall that it doesn't usually germinate in the fall, and it'll germinate first thing in the spring. Sometimes we get a little germination in the fall, and that's OK. But if, if we get really cold without snow cover, then you'll lose it. But cover crop is worth trying any way you can. You know, it's not that expensive to buy cover crop seed. It's not that much work to put it in. And your soil is so appreciative of it. So yeah. OK, I have some, we have about oh, eight minutes. I will take questions, but we also have buckets of soil, pots, and seeds. And you're each welcome to take a pot, put some seeds in it. I'll tell you what we have here. This is Tulsi. This is um, uh, sacred basil, also known as holy basil, one of my favorite crops. Why is this one of my favorite crops? It smells good. It smells like huckleberries. It's basil. How can you go wrong with basil? It's slightly hairy. It's the cold hardiest basil there is. Um, it actually has been known to take a light frost, which is pretty unusual for a basil. It does really well here. It's a small plant, it's, but it is phenomenally sweet. And it makes a nice tea. And of all the basils, it's the most medicinal basil. So we like that one. And then the other one I have here, um, I love peppers. I do a lot of pepper growing, pepper seed growing, pepper breeding, pepper selection. And this is Carlo peppers, I think. <laughs> I think. <laughs> well, Nine, you know, yeah, ninety-nine percent sure these are Carlo peppers. <laughs> a Carlo pepper is a semi-sweet, semi-hot. Kid strength chili rano, shaped like this, comes on yellow, thick walled, turns red reliably early, 24 things on a plant, if it's a colo. If it's not, it's a beaver dam. See, there's this one little, one little place that the kids have put seeds and they didn't put a label on it. But a beaver dam is also semi-sweet, semi-hot, slightly enormous, about like this. Um, they'll both be about the same heat and about very similar, but difference in size. And it will come on green, greenish yellow, kind of a chartreuse, and then turn red. All peppers are red when they're ripe. If you think you can't eat peppers, it's because you've been eating green ones, and they're immature, and you're reacting to that. It's got a little heat. Not a lot. I, I'm pretty, not, pretty darn That's sure it's I realized why I could eat green peppers, because mm -hmm. they're, they're not ripe. They're not ripe. They but we've been trained to eat them because they ship uh, better. Don't get me started on the food industry. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah. anyways. Um, Carlo is the pepper we've been, we've been selecting since the late 80s, and I love it. It's, it's so good in our climate. It's amazing. So, if, so what you're going to want to do, obviously these are really small seeds. They're smaller than poppy seeds. Pepper seeds are a little bigger. These will go a little deeper. Better. It's going to just work better getting ones that do well in your climate. Down south, it's different diseases, different bugs, different challenges. So. I couldn't tell you this soil is exactly the right moisture because I dug it in the dark and added a little bit of moisture. But you're welcome to fill your pot. You're do a demo? Yeah. Fill your pot. Put in, we'll bring these seeds over here. Put in, put in three seeds. They're going to get erratic death. You know. Oh, you cleaned them up for us. Thank you. And I bought popsicle sticks, and we go through a lot of popsicles. No, I buy the boxes. We haven't slobbered on these. <laughs> you don't want your seeds right on top of each other. You want to sprinkle them around a little bit. These are the little, the little um, basil. basil seeds, so I just press them down a little bit, and I'm going to sprinkle a little more soil on top. I would not water them until you get home. But go ahead and... It's probably not going to hurt them. It's going to fertilize them a little bit to freeze. But, <laughs> but if, you, if you want to, please help yourself. You can do one of, a pot of each if you want to. And you will know what they are when they come up. But if you want to label them so you know which varieties, that's great. OK. Do you have any idea of how much water that we would put on something this size? It's like a couple of tablespoons? Um, probably you want to sprinkle it because you don't want the water to just soak into it. You want to okay. do it a couple times. Think of a dry sponge. Put water on a dry sponge, it rolls off. Right. 
Right. If your little seeds near the surface are on there, those seeds are going to roll off too. That's one reason you plant in the dippy, because the dippy holds moisture, takes less moisture in the dippy. Like when we're in the field, they always talk about planting squash in hills. We have sandy soil. We don't plant in the hill. We plant in the dippy. We call it a depression, but I like the word dippy better than depressed. So. Right. Do you keep those stores stuff locally, or do you have to go down there to get it? I sell them in small bags. You have it. In small oh, bags. Okay. Um, you know, just the 20-quart bags. But um, if you want to get a, um, they do uh, totes, like 1,000-pound totes, that they can load into a pickup for you if you want. 1,000-pound totes. <laughs> Or, yeah, it's a field trip. Or they deliver to me by the dump truck load. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, but I... That's the place where they say they're never open, just try us or something? Well, it was two brothers and one passed, and so it's a one-man operation now, and, and he's got his hands full. So he hires... Um, he, when he, he doesn't deliver for me now. He hires someone Thank to deliver. You. you bet. Thank you. I'm glad you came. Come find us at the farmer's market. Come out to our greenhouse open house if you want to. It's, What's your farm called again? Terrapin. Um, our open house is usually the weekend before Memorial Day. The weekend before Memorial Day. Thank you. you bet. Thanks for coming.